And what is your connection to uh, Wiesen? I have a house here. I have uh, originally I came to Pocher, and then uh, I, I moved over here. That's it. That was a good move from Pocher to here. Yes. Okay. How uh, how many years have you been here? I think about thirty. I'm not sure. Yeah. That I moved. Okay. Beat that, Sally. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> and Sally? Uh, I'm Sally Drew. And your connection to uh, Wiesit? I uh, married a man who lived here, and that was uh, in 1966, and I've been here ever since. Okay. Okay. Where's your house, Sally? Right up the street on the left. Uh -huh. The big flagpole. Oh, yeah. I'm Andy Jelinas. Um, this is my 75th summer on the Cape. Uh, started coming here in 1939, and my folks started coming here in 1937. And uh, I now have a house at the corner of uh, Tonset Road as it runs down to the beach. Uh, I bought the house. Um, the original house in uh, 1972, mm -hmm. and uh, built another one in 2006. Mm -hmm. Perfect time to buy, 1972. I'm Elizabeth Hughes Gallagher. I came here when I was 11 months old in 1916, in the summers. Really? What was here in 1916? Pardon me? What was here for, for houses, for structures? They're yeah. old houses. This isn't like it was over yeah. here, as far as I know. I didn't know anything in 1916. I was just the baby. Yeah. That's amazing. You win the prize. <laughs> How old is your house? How long is that house? It was 100 years old the first no. time I heard about it. No, her house. I don't know. <laughs> you that one know. she's living in? Yeah. Uh, Two houses down. It was 41. Cousin Lena, uh, she married Mr. Rankin and they built it. Okay. And I think it was in 41 they built it. Okay. Uh, while I have the camera on, and you are? I'm uh, Elizabeth Hewins Bryson. I'm Mrs. Gallagher's niece. And the, own, the little house that looks right straight down Thompson Road. My great, great grandfather bought it with his brother as a hunting lodge. And the women liked it. And so they came up every summer. Really? And joined the party with the boys? Yes. And they, we, I, we've got some pictures of them in their woolen bathing suits <laughs> with long leggings and shoes. Is that the half cape? Y yes. Yeah. Yeah, the one that looks right straight down, down. the Thompson Road. Yeah, yeah. It's a classic. And it was the furthest house down on the point. Mm -hmm. At that time, yeah. And Bobby Howard's house and that house were built about the same time by Mr. Freeman. Mm-hmm. Marty, I just found out that your family owned own property, own this property. Most of it. I thought you were Cranberry Bogs, South Orleans, <laughs> that was it. No, I used to, I lived part of my life next door here. Really? And uh, off and on. My parents would, they considered this the summer home, so we moved from South Orleans to <laughs> Taunton. Uh-huh. And then back again. So I'm, I'm Bob Howard, Sally Drew's son. I came here in 1966 with my mother uh -huh. and currently live across the street uh, at 350 Tonsa Road, known as Weasett Hill, uh, which uh, is where my grandparents used to live. Oh, so quite a history here. Well, actually, I don't know when they actually purchased it. This was called originally Rich's Point, and, uh, or way back in some of the old deeds. And uh, somewhere along the line, it became the Wiesent proprietor way and uh, proprietor's way. And uh, my grandfather built the house that is now owned by the is where the Nichols house is. My, my father's grandfather's house was torn down 
when the Nichols uh, purchased it and uh, wanted a newer, more up-to-date home. Um, was this farmland the, the rich? Not to my knowledge. Uh, a great great uncle, Pearly Rich, owned the house on the end. Uh huh. And I believe Walter Rich originally owned the house diagonal, right across the street from this house. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was a boy, the house, one house back was the green, I believe it was green owned it at that time. It's now Martinson or something mm -hmm. of that nature. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, I don't know much about the native history, but yeah. uh, while my father, my father in the winter, in addition to growing cranberries, in the winter months he would put foundations under houses. So the people next door here, the, the where the Martinson house is, wanted him to put a partial foundation under. And in the process, uh, Harold Crow, as you may know or remember, uh, worked for my father in the cranberry business, but in the winter would do whatever needed to be done. And in the process of digging the foundation under that house, he dug up an Indian skeleton. And the time period, best we could figure, is 1956. And um, the skeleton was interestingly brought home to our home in South Orleans in an A&P shopping bag, brown paper bag. And a little side note to that is that my mother said, well, will you go out and get the groceries out of the car? And I brought in two bags, and one was the skeleton, and one was the groceries. Well, I put it on the counter, and she reached into the bag to get whatever she had purchased at the store and brought out a bone. And uh, the bones were then transferred to Harvard Medical for uh, carbon dating, I guess it's called. And uh, the results came back to us that it was presumed to be an Indian skeleton. It was buried in a very shallow grave. and. Uh, uh, pictures that the Cape Cotter took, we found an old picture and enlarged it. And uh, the picture, uh, what is the picture? Well, the picture represent? is Harold Crow, the gentleman who dug it up, oh. working for my father, with the bones laying out on a bulkhead. Uh, I believe the bulkhead was on the house across the street yeah. behind us. And uh, it has a caption if you want me to read it. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Harold Kroll of Orleans with some of the pieces of the skeleton he dug up last Saturday morning around 9 o'clock while doing some repair work on a house out on Taunton. The skeleton, which appeared to be quite old, was buried in a very shallow grave, not more than 18 inches underground. The section of the jaw still had two teeth in it, and that was the extent of it. I know the police were involved briefly because they weren't sure there had been some foul play, but they soon discovered that, or realized after Harvard Medical got at it, the bones, to uh, that it was presumably an Indian. Yeah. Well, did you get a, uh, a time frame from uh, Harvard with the carbon dating? No. no. Oh, yeah. if they did, I was, I don't recall yeah, what yeah. it was. Yeah. Were there any other artifacts that you're aware well, of that were found out there? No. Uh, over the years, Harold had quite a collection of arrowheads he found and he worked down here. He worked for my grandfather who lived next door first, mm -hmm. then my father and then eventually for me. I think altogether he was worked for the family for 65 years. So yes, he did find arrowheads, but I don't recall yeah, yeah. any artifacts over here. So when did, your, your family owned this property until when, or the majority of? Well, I, I don't know all the uh, the titles and how they worked out, but uh, it was my great my great grandfather was married more than once, so he had basically two families. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father, my grandfather, was an only child, as my as was my father, and um, um, grew up. My father grew up in Malden and here, and knew you very well. Richard Rich. My father, Richard Rich. Richard Rich. Was, oh, Richard, yes, yeah. I knew Richard. Yes, he tells me he dated you. Uh, <laughs> well, he I was, don't know. He was born in 1907 hmm. and was a 
Should we pick up on that, Bob? Let it lay there. Let it lay. Let it lay there. Let it lay there. Let it lay there. So, Betty, you weren't allowed to date, huh? I don't have a date. No, you weren't allowed to. <laughs> oh, I think she did right. I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> so, Marty, uh, we were talking about when your family, did they sell it all in one parcel to someone? No, uh, Pearly acquired some, Walter Rich acquired some, my father, my grandfather, Richard Rich. Uh, quiet song, and uh, you know, I, I look back on the deeds, and it's very hard to really figure it all out. Um, my when my grandfather died, of course, my father inherited the abutting property, and um, then sold it to the Newman family. And uh, after Mr. Newman passed away, we rented it out to. Uh, I rented it as a broker to. Uh, oh. Fred Wiseman. He was a oh, I know Fred. Producer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He documentaries. He's a, he's a great documentarian, and his style is uh, very unusual. In that some of his films, like Central Park, like uh, the court system in high schools, they would go on for three or four hours. Right. So you just let the camera go. And but then, I, I knew Fred. So Fred, how long? Ago, so Fred was here for. Well, a he few was just years. a tenant. Oh, okay. okay. He never bought or purchased the house. And then it was sold to Horace Nichols and his wife. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he tore the house, the original house down and built the one that exists now. Peter Wade and Dennis Bradley, I think. Or no. yeah. Peter Wade, I think, built it. Got anything, you got any racy stories about this neighborhood, Bob? Any racy we, we stories? Need pick, uh, we need to pick up the pace. I'm afraid I don't have any racy stories <laughs> to tell about. I've always wondered what the name Weesit means. It, it, it comes from Wampanoag. I've been uh, uh, interested in seeing if the Wampanoag Restoration Project, someone there might be able to help, but so far I, I haven't heard anything. Um, I do know that the, the Native Americans must have been here. It has all of the characteristics of uh, other places they've been active. We do have uh, on our property up the road uh, we have found one shell midden when I was digging uh, in a vegetable garden and did some initial, initial excavation with uh, Fred uh, uh, Dunford from the Harvard Todd Museum of uh, Natural History. Uh, we need to do a proper excavation at some point. Um, and other than that, I think uh, there may have been some archaeological digs done at the end of uh, Freeman Lane at one point. Betty. Got any anything you'd like to talk about this wonderful neighborhood of yours? You're like the mayor out here, aren't you? <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> All I know is I came up here as a baby, and my father graduated from MIT. I think it was 1916 or something like that. And my first mother died, and my father married the nurse. Married the nurse? Yes, she, she was my mother's nurse. Uh huh. And she was a Virginia lady, but it's the only mother I ever knew. Mm -hmm. And Daddy brought us up here every summer. And I, all I did was go sailing and swimming and fishing, or fished all the time. Did you really? Right here? Yes. Yeah. In that old house as it faces the river. Yeah, yeah. We fished right out there, yes. We had flounders for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> <laughs> we did. And my husband asked me if we, the family ate nothing but fish. <laughs> I said, we ate fish on Cape Cod, but nowhere else. There's a lot of shellfish out there too. I used to come sneak over here and get. There were mussels right down at the end of the landing for a while. We never ate mussels. But uh, I don't. But I, they kind of disappeared. No, they weren't on our menu at all. But clams, sea clams, and clams. Yeah. Not razor clams. Just those two and and uh, flounder. That's what we lived on up here. And I had a big galvanized tub, a little smaller than that, 
that I took a pitcher of water and filled. We didn't have a hose or anything like that. Yeah. I had to pump it and put it in the backyard, and that's where I got in, what I got into after I came back to get the salt off. <laughs> oh, you got in the tub. I thought you were going to tell me you put the fish in the tub. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so you catch striped bass right out here? Flounder. We catch fish for uh, flounder. Yeah. That's all we fish for. Oh, okay. But I'm sure they had other things. Yeah. But we never ate anything but flounder. Not a bad diet. Um, I don't know. I just enjoyed being having my summers and meeting these people <laughs> as they came. You know, I, I I went around quite a bit overseas with my husband who served in the Air Force. Graduated from West Point in 1933. Mm -hmm. um, and I married and went wherever he was stationed. Yeah. I, I don't think I know anything more. But you'd get back here pretty much every summer, even though you were traveling? As long as we were on the East Coast. No. But no. we were in Africa and Germany and Florida and different places. Yeah. And... An interesting life. Came back every summer. Yeah. No matter where I was, I came home in the summer. <laughs> Well, why wouldn't you? This is a spectacular location. You have a story about your boat? What about your boat? My father had a great big yacht, but he, he brought it in here, um, a 53-footer, and he had it up here. I don't know how. Beth can tell you all this. She remembers and I don't. Okay. When you get to her, she'll tell you everything. Tell me, where, where did um, your family come from? Uh, Massachusetts? Massachusetts. My birth mother came from Massachusetts and my father did. But he the Boston, the Boston area? from Virginia, so I mm -hmm. was brought up in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. by our summer. Okay. And I took my bath in a tub in the backyard. <laughs> and pumped gallons of water in my lifetime. With your bikini on, though. You had a little bikini on, didn't you? Not in those no days. <laughs> I had a bikini. Really? <laughs> had one down to here. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> didn't have any bikinis in those days. <laughs> you didn't bother with them anyway, right? Right. Let me uh, just talk a little about the Indians, if I could. Great. Um, if you read uh, Champlain's journals, uh, he came here in 1603 and uh, came into uh, Nosset Harbor and describes the whole of the periphery of the harbor covered with uh, Indian settlements. And um, it was clear that they had uh, at least their summer uh, lodgings here. Mm. And um, he tells stories about coming ashore trying to get water. One of the Indians tried to steal a big pot that they were going to carry the water in. And the poor guy got shot by an arrow, and it wasn't a very happy uh, landing. Not a good beginning between the Indians and the English. Right. And he also, uh, well, he was French. Uh, oh, yes, of course. He, he also uh, uh, said that the harbor itself was very uh, inhospitable because of the sandbars and uh, uh, very difficult to come in and out of. Yeah. So for a long time it was just not uh, really on the map as, a, as an hospitable place. Yeah. The um, social life was pretty lively when I, when I joined up down here. Uh, many of the neighbors had this little um, group called Nutty Crest. And, uh, they were called what? Nutty Crest. Betty knows all about Nutty Crest. She was in it. She's probably the ringleader. <laughs> <laughs> and the Benisons and uh, Beth, you may even remember. I don't remember the names. Uh, but when Nutty Crest met, I uh, babysat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they really i think they started partying at about eight o'clock in the morning and it went all day and it never ended and they rented the two houses uh up the street that are um 
Ecclesia. Across That's from the yeah. Worch. Yeah, across from the Worches, which was the, the originally um, where the Marsh House is now, uh, right up the street next to me. Uh huh. And they rented these, these cottages in the summer, and they partied and went out uh, clamming and just had the most marvelous time. All fishing. summer long. Oh, never ended. We <laughs> <laughs> part of that. Uh, yeah, I'll bet you were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they really had a great, great time. It was uh, very unique. They had their own flag. Yeah. Which they would fly, and I don't know whatever became of that. Betty, maybe you know, but uh, it was Barbara Wright and a lot of people that that you know, Dave uh -huh. and Nellie Benison, and and his brother and wife, and quite a crew. Quite a crew. I came here because of the Wisemans. Actually, they were close friends of my husband's and mine, and uh, that was Paul Berger. And um, they had the house that is the Nichols house now uh, in a it's not kind of, uh, uh, I want to say, uh, not sure Rusty. that we, <laughs> no, uh, you never knew that it was going to be standing the next day. <laughs> and. Um, but the view was so sensational, and it completely eradicated Pochard and Nauset and everything else for me. I determined to find a house on Wieset Point. Yeah. And I can remember, I saw that year, uh, the seven houses became available for, selling, for, to, for sale. And they were all very expensive for those days, mm -hmm. $140,000, yeah. yeah. and I couldn't afford that. And I went to my last house, uh, and the, the person who was selling that, I can't remember her name, uh, came out and said, well, this house uh, is for sale. and the. It's just gone on the market, and the lady is very. Uh, uh, she is very nervous about uh, her ability to sell it. So she dropped the price from nine, well, from a um, hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars to ninety thousand dollars. And I said, that makes a great difference. Mm -hmm. That so, was very thoughtful of her. <laughs> yes, very. And mm. I, I bought the house and have lived here uh, summers ever since. Wow. You any good Betty stories? <laughs> yes, they'd, they'd hit the beach as soon as the tide would permit. Yeah. Every day. Every day? Every day. Wow. And um, as a child, uh, Phil Drew, was our Pied Piper, and he just drew all the children, which there were not that many of at the time. Yeah. And he had a, a Mrs. Wirtz's or her husband's sailboat, and he would load that up and then haul a dinghy or two behind it, and we'd go to the outer beach for the day. And the whole point would go. <laughs> He so he, he down he, across the inlet. Yes. Oh, yes. We so did. he piled the kids into the uh, into the the coast guard would have the a thing. Fit. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and off he'd go. So they they were in the outer beach uh, most weekends. So. Yes, and the sandbar. There was only one sandbar in here at the time, mm -hmm. and it was right next to that first marsh, and it was a great big sandbar, but the water was eight, ten feet off the marshes, Wow! and uh, we had very deep water. I know, because we had lines that we fished with, and yeah. they went down forever, but it was clear water then, and we could see the flounder and <laughs> wow. jerk. Wow. And we'd clam, and whatever they wanted for dinner, the mm -hmm. kids would be sent out to get. <laughs> 
but a special area just to go out and yeah get your breakfast yeah <laughs> lunch and dinner you are Nancy Valiant uh-huh and we came to the point through Malabar lucky us <laughs> we were renting in poach it and we didn't realize the real estate agent would not call us in the morning and of the first of January or the second and say do you still want to rent your house that we had to call and so we lost the house and poached it, and I called Malabar, and she said, well, I know of a very good house, a wonderful house, that I have a good friend, Henry Scammell, has just bought, and he'd like to rent it for the summer, or at least half of the summer. Henry did? Henry wanted to, and and she said, he, he he's it's on Weasett Point, it's the house right at the end of the point. Wow. And she said, I'll give you his number and call him. And so we did, and Henry rented it to us. And then he had to sell it. Had some financial problems and had to sell it. But he arranged with the real estate agent who sold it to Margie and Peter White. His name was Richardson White from Washington, D.C. Um, he arranged to have us still able to rent for half of the summer. Mm -hmm. And um, we arrived, oh, before, before we arrived, I called back, I called the agent, said, um, now are you sure, is there a washer and a dryer? And she said, a washer, but not a dryer. But she said, wait till you see the view when you're hanging up the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so well, she was right, I mean, it was marvelous, and we were, just so happy there. The agent had um, not told us there wouldn't be very much furniture. <laughs> Fortunately, a lot of the furniture had been built into the the, the bedrooms. Oh, like yeah. the, the, the um, I can't remember the name of the man who, I think you mentioned somebody named Pearlie. Yeah, Pearlie Rich. Pearlie. Yes, and, and he had built the, the mirror right into the wall and the and the um, bureau into the wall in our bedroom, and the same in a little room next to us, and it was just marvelous. But when we had um, Oren and Midge Tavroff for dinner, they couldn't see over the, the bridge table we were eating at. They were eating in those camp chairs that fold up, and they, they were small, oh, yeah. and they immediately called Swan's realtor next morning and said something has to be done about this. So <laughs> suddenly we were outfitted even with an ironing board and I don't iron. That sounds very orange, <laughs> very yes, orange top um, rough. But the Whites loved the house and when Whitney wrote, we were there for five summers. Whitney wrote us, uh, it was actually six summers, um, but Whitney was wrote this piece, a journal for the New Yorker magazine titled We Sit Point. And um, about the wildlife, and he did quote, you know, from Champlain's writings mm -hmm. about coming into the harbor, and um, interviewed Mr. Ritt. My father. Yes, your father. I knew it couldn't have been you. No. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, he was a great help. Your father was a great help, and and there was something that he said which I thought was so interesting. I don't know if it's in the piece, but about the trees. He said it was important to keep the trees low because then you'd have long, strong roots. But if they were very tall, the roots would be short. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that always stood out. I mean, I don't know very much about planting, but that always stood out mm. in my mind. The parrot used to come, be hung out on the porch, and you'd say, Lydia! Are you going uptown today? <laughs> this was this parrot was your this pet. This was a parrot. Yes, it was, was your pet. My father's bird. Wow. We were brought up with this <clears throat> parrot, and Lydia would come running out and <laughs> discussing with the parrot. <laughs> that was before my day, so I don't remember that. I just remember hearing about it, okay. but I thought that was a funny incident. What was the parrot's name? Lorita. Lorita. Had a little Latin. It's a little, a big green bird with a yellow fronted yep. 
head. Yep. And beautiful feathers. You couldn't see them until she opened them up. But they were beautiful. I still have some. And they live forever. <laughs> The parrots live forever. Oh, they live to be a hundred yeah. at least. Yeah. Or she was at least ninety-seven after coming down from I don't know. We, we always said she was a hundred years old. Well, my memory is um, I used to lobster out here, and there used to be a boathouse right down in front of uh, the wolf's house, a little bit further away, and. Uh, that was where we kept the lobster. My father kept his lobster pots when he was young, and uh, I then took that on when I was a teenager, and lobstering and selling the lobsters at uh, Lloyd Ellis's market really? on the road. And he built me. He built all the lobster pots for me, and he built a lobster car, which, for those who are not familiar, is to keep the male and female lobsters separated but in the water, and it floated just about at water level. And I'd wait until I had enough lobsters and I would take them up to Lloyd Ellis's. Uh, my other memories were, of course, playing with uh, a lot of the local people, the Jalinuses, but I don't know which one I played with. Uh, Randy Gallagher, uh, Marsha Templeton, Marsha Haley Templeton, up at the top of the hill. Uh, that's the Joshua Crosby house, if she owns that now. And. Um, uh, supposedly I'm her fifth cousin, but I never could quite figure that one out. Uh, I used to bow and arrow hunt for rabbits, and I could walk from here right through to Freeman's Way, and there was no virtually no trees, it was just low brush. Uh, and I believe where your home, did you own the home, Mrs. Bordeaux, at the end of the Taunton Road, right at the landing? Yes. Well, that used to be Herb Johnson's, and I think yes, the lady yes. you were thinking of was Alice Jones. Yes, yes. And I used to take, and of course we used to fish out here too for flounder. And <laughs> we would, but occasionally in the lobster pot I'd catch an eel. Uh -huh. And didn't know the first time, didn't know how to clean the eel. And so I took it over to Herb Johnson, and even my brother, who's older than I am, remembers doing that. Uh, we used to trail it home because I couldn't take it off the hook. Oh, well, we, <laughs> well these were caught in the lobster pots. And uh, so I'd take it over there and he showed me how to clean an eel and cut it and uh, fillet it, I should say, to correct term. And uh, well, those were some of the memories. Uh, um, were, the lo were the lobster pots right out here? Yes, right out in, front. inside the harbor. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, there was a point in time when Police Chief Yabansky, if I recall his name, when I would see divers go out around the rocks where I had my pots, and we weren't sure whether they were taking the lobsters out of the pots or just cleaning out the lobster supply around the rock. But I had lobster pots spread all around here near Stony Island, and this rock right out here in front of this house. Um, and all of a sudden I wasn't getting any lobsters which was very upsetting because I was looking for that money from the lobsters. But uh, these are just some of the memories I had mm -hmm. down here. Uh, we had, uh, my father, my grandfather had chicken coop and an apple orchard and we would pick apples and I have pictures of me pushing the wheelbarrow. Uh, my father started in the garage right behind this, right behind where I'm sitting, was the first cranberry processing sort of plant that I can recall on the Cape, or anyone can recall. He used to screen his cranberries there and store his cranberry boxes in the winter. And then he built a big one up, up in South Orleans, but a uh, bigger uh, screening plant. You know, Marty, you mentioned, um, and several people have, about the flounder, the shellfish, lobsters. It's an amazingly productive oh, yeah. body of water. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, there's not, also striped bass, any, bluefish. Not anymore. No? Not anymore. <laughs> Seals have cleaned out the flounder. And yeah. now they're working on the shellfish. Yeah. Well, yeah. also, the cormorants. I've seen two or three cormorants that I have about in Pleasant Bay. 
with uh, flounders about that big in yeah. their mouth that they'll just get on yeah. the bottom and and uh, yeah yeah the seals and the cormorants. There was only one cormorant when we were in the five years we were at the point, and it yes. was on the rock every day, and it had an injured wing, didn't didn't fly, but only one from 1978 to 83. Well, there weren't any when we were young. We, we have so It's just amazing. Yeah. Things change. <laughs> yes, yes. I had something else I, I thought was amusing. Um, I used to take my sons, because my late husband didn't like to fish, didn't like to kill anything, and so I take them out in a rowboat. And was, I, I only had two hand lines and two hooks, and they would catch flounder. And we got seven one day, and I read in a book how to outline the fish with a knife and pull the skin back. And because my late husband didn't like bones either, I thought, <laughs> you know, flounder Munier. And so we would, we went to Matt Reed's bake shop one morning to get some bait. And my older son, who was about, oh, I don't know, 10 or 11, started bragging about the flounder we'd been catching. And they said, oh, where? Uh, he said at the point, he's at point. And he described, you know, what they were like and how mm -hmm. often we get them. And next morning, a boat came out, and the whole Reed family was in it wearing winter clothes. <laughs> Winter clothes, poking around, and all, all that lines out. I don't know whether they left discouraged, but we really thought it was funny. <laughs> they delivered groceries, yeah. and they delivered ice, and we had ice chests because there's no electricity and no plumbing in the house. We had a little house out back. Uh huh. <laughs> we had to yeah. sing a little town. Yeah, we'd go. We were left here. We had to sing it if you wanted to go uptown. Did you used to take the barge? You know what I mean by the barge? The barge. You know the the old horse and buggy. Oh no! Well, they call I didn't the... have anything to do. That was my father's. Okay. Okay. Time we we had automobiles. <laughs> <laughs> but you could row, you know, and just go up the coast. Sure. And then just walk. Yeah. Well, um, as I said, we started coming here, my folks started coming here in 1937, and they rented uh, Herb Johnson's cottage, uh, where uh, Malabar now lives, and uh, uh, they rented that for about five years until Herb decided to uh, retire and live there full time. My dear mother uh, never wanted to buy a place on the Cape. She always said that she wanted to come into a house with her suitcase and go out with her suitcase and just rent. And uh, very understandable with four kids and about a five and a half hour drive up here and the houses had to be winterized and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. But uh, I think if my dad had uh, had his way, he might have bought a, a place. Mm -hmm. Herb uh, had a big sign over his garage called Captain Herb Johnson. And uh, he got that by dint of uh, Betty's brother taking him out uh, on a Coast Guard cutter. And uh, they made a tour, and he was out there for a week or two, and came back, and he was the captain. And, uh, <laughs> so he was captain of the port. He was captain of the port. And, he um, sat out there and watched everything, and if anybody was in trouble, Uncle Herbie would get in his little boat and come get us. He, kept a, he captainized himself. Yep. Yes. And Herb had a uh, garage in which he permitted uh, pretty much anybody on the point who wanted to to keep their outboard motors. And of course the motors then were fairly small. They were uh, three and a half to seven horsepower. Yeah. And uh, you'd take them off the boat every night and take them up to Herb's garage and um, put the motor in a barrel and run it so you'd clean out the salt water and everything keep your oars in there. And then uh, either Gertrude, his wife, or Alice Jones, uh, who spend the summer with them, would have chocolate chip cookies for all the kids. And uh, so it was a great treat to go out in the boat. 
When I was uh, young, there were only five boats out in front of uh, Tonset Landing. There were three uh, wooden rowboats uh, and two sailboats, and one uh, belonged to Herb, and the other one belonged to uh, your uh, brother, or your, maybe your father. And they were uh, flat-bottomed, and you steered the sailboats with an oar, uh, using the oar as the rudder and the tiller. And there's a hole in the stern of the of the boat, and you stuck the mm -hmm. oar through that. Oh. That was your tiller. And then Fred Wirch bought a uh, beautiful white uh, uh, day sailor, and uh, it was a lovely town class boat, I think they called them. And uh, uh, small point of contention uh, was the time when uh, Phil Drew decided that uh, uh, he needed to paint that boat, and so he painted it black. <laughs> and he christened it the Black the Witch, Black Witch. <laughs> and I think that caused a little bit of consternation in the Wirch Drew household. <laughs> and then, uh, to make matters worse, he put a uh, uh, thing on the end uh, on which you could put an outboard motor. And so he put he had a seven and a half horsepower uh, Scott Atwater outboard motor, which he put on the Black Witch, and I think. You know, it was pretty bad. I mean, that just wasn't done. Um, you didn't do that to us. I, have, didn't I, do that I to haven't heard that brand, Scott Atwater, <laughs> since I was 12 years old. I forgot about that. The yeah. Scott Atwater. Scott Atwater. And uh, he would tie up the three wooden dinghies and pull everybody over to the North Beach with the, with the sailboat. And uh, we had more fun. Phil would run uh, field days on the flats. Uh, he had a shotgun. And all the kids would get out there, and we had spent the night before making uh, the prize ribbons, first, class, second, third, mm -hmm. and all the kids would get out there, and he would have uh, the broad jump and the 50-yard uh, dash and the 100-yard dash. Oh, really? And he'd start every one of them with the shotgun, <laughs> <laughs> like out on a boom, and the kids would run off, and you'd win your prize. And, uh, then we'd all where when you say the flats, where are you talking about? Out uh, there, right there. Yep. Sandbars. Yep. If you turn yeah. your camera around and yep. point it at that sandbar, you're pretty close to the place. Wow. Then we moved up to uh, when Herb retired. Uh, uh, we found a place to rent. Uh, by the way, we found Herb's cottage through um, a connection with the Sea Call Farm. Uh, Bill Fisk and his wife had come here in the twenties and started farming uh, in earnest in the early 30s. And they had a daughter, Gertrude Fisk. And Gertrude uh, was a professor at the Fitchburg, then called the Fitchburg Normal School, and taught there with my mother. And uh, so my mother and father and uh, Gertrude, or Fiske as we called her, became close friends. So after my parents married, uh, they were looking for a place to spend uh, vacation in 1937 and Fiske arranged uh, for us to rent Herb Johnson's place for about five years. Then we found another place uh, up next to the Nutty, <laughs> Nutty Hall. Nutty Annie 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 I don't Annie remember Annie. it. I never was there myself. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> was. Heaven <laughs> forbid. <laughs> All I remember is that there were some young kids that used to come over looking for breakfast because yeah, they weren't getting any food. <laughs> How, how, in like 1937, how would you get here from, where did you come from? From uh, Fitchburg. From Fitchburg. Massachusetts. So, so how, you drive uh, by car. By car. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, we only had one car, so uh, for the time that we were here and my dad was up working, uh, we uh, had no transportation to town. Yeah. And uh, someone on the point had a car, so there'd be an arrangement to... Uh, go up to do shopping, or they deliver, or they deliver the ice. And then we'd walk to uh, Ruggles Farm, mm -hmm. which is about uh, probably half to three quarters of a mile. And you could buy milk and eggs and uh, oh. a few other things at Ruggles Farm. Yeah. And then we'd stop on Sunday morning at uh, Harry and Gertrude Hunt's place. And uh, Harry uh, was the only lobster fisherman fishing out of this harbor for years and years and years. 
and uh, Harry would uh, sell the lobsters in his garage on Sunday morning. Mm. So and that's why, that's why we had fish. Right. Because Harry had a shotgun and we had no seals. Right. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and it seems that everybody who tried to kind of begin to do some lobster fishing had several kinds of difficulties. That, yes, uh, yes, yes. So Harry uh, yes, ended up to be the, about the only one fishing off of Snow's uh, shore. And Gertrude Hunt, uh, we moved up to the top of the hill where uh, the Grangers now live. And Gertrude Hunt bought that house for her uh, daughter, Marilyn, when her daughter got married in 1953, I believe. And so my family rented a place on Brick Hill Road, uh, the Annie Ams Cottage, where the Van Tassels now mm -hmm. live. And they um, summered there, uh, and we summered there until uh, my wife and I bought uh, Clarice Smith's cottage mm -hmm. in 1972. And then they uh, <laughs> assisted me with the purchase by renting for a period of time. I was thinking about uh, Harry Hunt and the, and the lobster situation, and, and uh, I remembered Phil saying, oh yes, you know, his wife Gertie, she was very strong. And I know. He, he said he, she would be walking up a Tonset Road with about a 50-pound bag of lobsters on her back. And, you know, she, she was quite amazing. And apparently at some point Harry bought her this Cadillac, which is still there and still running. And she hated it. She didn't know how to run it. She, she didn't know what all the buttons were. And, it, you know, a Cadillac was just not Gertie's kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's more of a Jeep girl. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't realize we were talking way back with Phil. So Phil was here. Yeah, he was here. Gosh, when the Wurches were here, which is the cottage next to where I am. Mm. And uh, he had a lobster business, which he started. He had a little lobster business over around where um, Goose Hummock is. And then for some reason, I, I can't remember why, they said that he couldn't sell lobsters there. Or, so he opened the East Ham Lobster Pool, which is now Max Seafood, I Stewart's. guess, and Stewart's Restaurant in East Ham up by Brackett Road. Yeah. Which he ran um, for quite a while. And then he sold that just as, at the time we were married. So. Uh -huh. But he would eat a lobster every day. Really? Mm -hmm. Not after we were married, just when he had the restaurant. <laughs> there were several uh, little islands out here off, to, off of the, uh, the coastline, one of which was called Goose Hummock, and that was the name taken by uh, Governor Sargent when he opened the store with that name uh, down by the, the Orleans Rotary. So a hummock refers to the grassy outcropping? I think it's when just you say a the word island. for a hill or a uh -huh. hill of some sort. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. And I'm not certain, but I think the Blueberry Islands were part of the same, uh, were out here as well. Mm -hmm. And those have sort of eroded away, is that? Those have long gone, Yeah. yeah as the ocean continues to get closer. Is there any uh, information on the huge boulder that's down mm -hmm. here? I do remember as a kid um, being yelled at when we tried to climb up there yeah. uh, by the fellow who lived behind, uh, uh, up on the shore there, I can't remember who it was, um, and he promptly went down on the side of the rock where it was easy to get up and filled in all the low crevice hand holes with mortar. Oh my God. So that now you couldn't go up that side and then somebody <laughs> managed to go up the other side and drove in a metal spike and tied a, a line around it so you could just go up that way. I didn't think he was too fond of that idea. Well, I remember when the inlet was out here under the heights and my father said it would go all the way up and be open up at the lighthouse. The inlet would work up to the lighthouse and it's almost there or it's past it. <laughs> you can't believe how much is extended in the last year. Yeah. Even the last year. I was shocked. I was out there a few days ago.
But it was right out in front of the old house. But in the late 60s, it was right at right the foot of Austin um, Heights. Heights. Yeah. Yeah. I have a picture in a car of the inlet right there. Yeah. Well, something's going to happen because it's... It's so close now to the lighthouse, you wouldn't believe it if you went out there. That's where he said it would stop. <laughs> There's what? He said it would go up to the lighthouse. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't predict anything farther. <laughs> From the end of the heights to the end of the spit is 2.4 miles now. Now? Now. As of four days ago. Okay, that's interesting. Really? And it used to be... Right at the end of the height. Right at the foot. Well, I was just going to relate a couple things. My grandfather used, there used to be cottages on the dunes out here. And my grandfather would call up and say, well, you better get down today because we're going to lose another one. Wash into the sea. Or wash off, wash over. Uh, another thing he used to do, he'd call up and say to my father, this was really when I was an infant, that a two-masted schooner or three-masted schooner is heading south. And if you look out your window, you'll probably see it in about an hour, right from Port Nemecan Road, because there weren't any trees to yeah. block the view. And uh, that was always the case. Another thing I just wanted to point out, the fence along your property line, my father built, that's all made of poured concrete. The whole, the, the posts are all poured concrete, along with the markers for your father's old house, the little half cave has cement markers on either side, mm -hmm. and those were uh, made by my father. And every one of them has his uh, brand mm -hmm. in the bottom of it, way down underground. Oh. Uh, so that's, uh, but he did that commercially, he made them. That was before they had pressure treated wood, so people were, uh, but uh, to go back to the, uh, the sinking of the barges off the Cape. It was a Sunday morning. My father's written a lot of it, and it's his handwritten uh, letter in, among the pictures. Uh, they were getting ready to go to church, and they would get in the boat, a five horsepower motor, and they would go uptown to get the Sunday paper. And if, well, I don't think it was church. Go up to get the Sunday paper. They would go by boat. And they heard this shelling uh, or noise, and, he could watch with field glasses from his second floor bedroom next door here where the Nichols live. And uh, they then got in uh, a boat, I'm not sure whose it was, and they went to the outer beach right where the inlet used to be and watched the event take place and watched the uh, people come ashore from the, from the uh, tugboat. Uh, and then they were brought up under the heights, I guess. But it was after that that my grandfather went out with the Boston Globe Reporter, and I passed around the pictures of that. And my grandfather's pictures in several or a couple of them out on the uh, barge that they brought out to try to dynamite or get the barges that were stacked one on top of the other to get them to fall to the bottom because it was a hazard to navigation. And while he was out there, my grandfather uh, took a piece of the shrapnel, carved it out of the hull, and uh, that's uh, been passed on down in generation. That's a piece of a German uh, surface uh, shell. The changes in the inlet, I think people have talked about that. Uh, the inlet used to be down in front of Nosset Heights. Uh, in fact, if you go down there now, there's a plaque on a stone uh, commemorating the two guys who rode across the Atlantic. I think they left in 72. The Irish, the Irish fellows. Right. Yeah. And, that pla and that stone <laughs> used to be in the middle of the water in that harbor there. It's now completely uh, embedded in sand. In fact, you have to dig down or someone has dug down a few feet so that you can even see the stone with the plaque on it. Uh, and that's just one part of how things, how much things have changed yeah. out here. One other thing that my father, he was an avid uh, duck hunter, and he set his decoys out here, but he also raised his own ducks right next door, and uh, so he had live duck decoys. Oh, that's and, illegal. Oh. 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 
way back then. Uh, they didn't decide it was illegal then. And he uh, also commented in the article that for your your husband wrote uh, about getting a bounty on the seal noses. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, uh, they're talking about doing it again. Hmm. I don't know if we can. I don't. I get don't. the seal huggers to agree. <laughs> We might have fish again if they did. And the other other thing is is that there was some pictures that I found, uh, I think they were 1935, of my grandfather and my father. Uh, and it wasn't next door, but it was somewhere immediately in this area. Uh, my father told me where it was, and unfortunately he's passed away, so I can't tell, but this is a, a shark that uh, was brought in. Uh, from offshore. Randy has the best location on Wiesa. That used to be the shed out in the backyard of the old house. Uh huh. And we had it towed and put down there on the beach for him. Yeah. And so they have enjoyed many summers down there. That's incredible. Somebody here has mentioned the houses out on the beach, and there was uh, yep. a number of cottages on the north side of the beach, including the outermost house. Mm -hmm. And um, a good friend of mine, uh, Bill Guile, the Giles lived down at the end of Uncle Mark's Way, the water, and uh, he and I were about of an age. And we used to uh, be able to take the boat with our three horsepower motor, and we'd go over and sleep out on the beach. And uh, we'd build a fire, and we'd kind of pretend we were Henry Beston listening to the water mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. stuff like that and we brought our fishing poles and we were going to catch our supper which we never caught. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we always had a supply of sandwiches and uh, then we'd wrap up and go to sleep and uh, one time we were out there and I, uh, it was chilly and I rolled so close to the fire that uh, the coal started the blanket uh, to, to burn a little bit, and uh, I woke up just in time <laughs> and put out the fire. It was a great, great times for summer. And My father said the end of the point when he was young was all planted in strawberries. Really? Yes, and he told me this after we had a path from the house down into the cove, and uh, I went down there and I found some strawberries and I came back and I said, these look like real strawberries, you know, and he said, well, yeah, they, they used to be all strawberries all over the point. Wow. And he said, I, I earned summer money picking them and taking them to Ellis's. <laughs> and wow. um, then the Freemans had a cow, but this was two generations, three generations back. And uh, when our family wanted cream, they would uh, go upstairs and look out the back bedroom window. And if the Freemans had cream, they'd hang a towel out the window. <laughs> and so Daddy would get his little bucket and go back and get some cream. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And uh, when Loretta would holler, Lydia, you want to go to town? That was my great grandmother and Lydia, wasn't it? Or was it grandmother? Anyway, she would be upstairs in our window and hollering up to Bob's house, and nothing in between, mm. no trees, nothing. <laughs> so it, they said that they cut all the trees for uh, the big tall ones that were here for the uh, shipping industry. And uh, it was just no trees, you know, and then as the houses were built, people would plant trees around yeah, the house. No. Did your husband, was he on the staff of the New Yorker? Yes. He was. And his name is what again? Whitney Balliot. Balliot, Whitney. He wrote about um, jazz. Uh, he was he had a column, um, which Mr. Sean, the editor, gave him in 1957. It was the first 
column on jazz. Mm -hmm. And so he, I mean, he wrote over 550 pieces wow. for the New Yorker. And, um, well, when, from what period did he? From about 1957. Uh, he started in the early 50s, yeah. as you traditionally, to, in the editorial department, take lesser jobs. And he um, did. Was it the newsbreak desk? Paul was on the newsbreak yeah, desk. Right. He came after Whitney, but and then talk of the town, and then he began writing about jazz for the Saturday Review, and and Mr. Shaw, the editor, read those pieces and and wanted Whitney mm -hmm. to write about jazz for the New Yorker. So he was a contributor to the talk of the town uh, pieces. Really. No, the early days when he was um, oh. starting out. Okay. But but he also um, he re he reviewed. Fiction and, and and fact and and um, I have to point this out that because he was writing about jazz musicians, um, I read about critics who wrote for magazines in the same years that he was writing, and he wrote about black people, and no one else was writing about black people, and um, it was you know he he was very interested, he was, had this fascination and became fascinated with Wiesa Point and exactly how the Indians, you know, worked there and how they mm -hmm. managed with the tide and it took some time before we really went out in this four-person canoe. I practiced for a whole year with my fork at the dining room table in New York City, but, you know, I had to listen and when so, so you lived in you lived in Manhattan during those years. Yes. Yeah. And, and did I you come up did. here summers? Yes. In fact, when I wrote down when I was writing everything out, um, I wrote a list of all the houses that we rented. My my mother died in two thousand three, and I bought a house on on Great Oak Road, mm -hmm. two hundred year old house. But all of the houses, all of the years for my son, so that they would, you know, remember them all. But after Hurricane Bob. We were out of here. We brushed our teeth by candlelight for ten days, and and we went to Wellfleet, and then to um, Truro, and then North Truro, and the next stop was going to be Provincetown. I couldn't wait. <laughs> and then everybody in our family said, "You have to buy a house in Orleans." That's where we started out. Mm -hmm. So as close to the point. It didn't say we rented the Whitlock house which was a wonderful place to be. A little porch and all that property in the back that went down to Woods Cove for walks. Oh, okay. Over there, yeah. Yeah. When did your uh, husband pass away? In 2007. 2007. February 1st, yeah. And he worked up until, when, when did he stop working uh, with the New Yorker? New Yorker in the late 90s. Uh -huh. But when we were, we spent two summer, t t I mean two, bits of the fall. Uh, 1971, we moved to Vernon Smith's little concrete house that Frank Joy had bought, built for him. On Monument Road? Yes. And we, we lived there. We had a, a, a five-month-old baby and a, and a, and a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't have, you know, the proper clothes to go to a cocktail party. I remember the Strakolovskis and Pocha asked us to a cocktail party and everybody was wearing velvet and silk and I had on a blue jean skirt which had a slit right here and Mrs. Strakolovsky said, that's a very interesting skirt, Nancy. <laughs> no, we were camping out but Whitney had the material. He was writing a piece about Bobby Short one year and Mabel Mercer another year. So he rented one of those little um, motel units that, that, that Frank Joy brought down from Provincetown, yeah. and there was, you know, you had to get the hornet's nest out, and there was always a bed in there, and he, he made a, 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 a board desk, and it was great fun to stay here, so we got to know so much more. So you got to know Vernon Smith pretty well then? No, he just died. Oh. But we, we got to know his carving, and yeah. the mantle over the fireplace there. Yeah. And Lovely, lovely introduction to the Cape. Vernon was a bow of my mother's. <laughs>
Oh, uh, what it's worth. Really? Yes. Hmm. He was a household word. Yeah. <laughs> he was the town artist. Yeah. I have some nice paintings of his of local scenes. Yeah. And and he would regale us with uh, stories about how he, during the worst years of the Depression, he uh, went up to um, Alaska. Yep. Uh, and worked for the WCA? The WPA. WPA. Oh, yeah. Got one of those <laughs> alphabet things. Yeah. He was the representative on Cape Cod for collecting paintings. He'd go to Provincetown, collect paintings, and he would decide which artists um, would be paid by the government in that artistic program. That, um, oh, really? Yeah. Yep. There are a lot of people down here from Boston, and they, everybody around here went to the Red House and the White House up the hill. And one day, uh, one of them in Brewster was ready to come over here and her father said, uh, where are you going? And she said over uh, to Orleans, oh, you're going to that nutty Chris. <laughs> so from then on, we were known as from the nutty Chris. Okay, that's where you go. But they were all doctors and lawyers and professional people from Boston. And Uncle Phil, who lived across the street, Phil Drew, always got acquainted with everybody. And then he'd get us into it, and so that's how they got their name. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Betty, um, uh, you were here as a teenager, right? I'm what? You were here um, when, in your, when you were a teenager, 14 oh, yes, to... Yes. Did you? Were there any summer romances that um, you had with, <laughs> with any of the, uh, the tourists that would come here? I wasn't allowed to date up here, so if that's your question. Yeah. No, we 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 <laughs> kept right up here on the point. Daddy would take us to the outside beach every morning. Yeah. And then we said he was hiding in the dunes to see what we were doing. But ah. And then he'd come over and pick us up and bring us home. I had a brother and a sister. Uh huh. But. My brother did his own things, and I don't know what he did as a teenager. I was much younger. Yeah. But my sister was with me back and forth to the beach. Uh -huh. And most of these people that we were associated with were Boston area people. But uh, we, were, we stayed right here on yeah. the point. Yep. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't go to the movies. We didn't do anything. We were right here. Good place to be. Yes, we thought so. I always cried when I had to leave. Yeah. It was pretty sad. We didn't want to go home.